Well, I'll have more of that. I should have taken some time for that because Professor Dole has very kindly consented to take us over some of the early practices in building and style in Oregon architecture. And he is very knowledgeable on this subject. As we talked before, is when I gave this talk before, and I know I've always learned a great deal from it. So without further ado, I am going to Professor Philip Dole and take over. We hope that that's the truth. I think the mic's on, isn't it? Anyway, it's all being recorded <laughs> a couple times over. Really ridiculous. I, I put on the uh, board some topics I'm going to talk about. You might want to write down the Maybe terms. Turn the mic. And as for reading, uh, I would uh, elaborate what Marion said. For the last three items, you might like to look at Henry Russell Hitchcock's book on American architectural books, which is on your reading list, I noticed. And for the part I'm talking about, you might like to look at uh, Vaughn's book on, on Oregon architecture, which has in it some of the stuff I'm talking about that, that I wrote for that book. The, I'll just run down those terms very quickly. The, the, the first three are terms, uh, are period terms used in the mid-19th century by Oregon people of their buildings. And there are two types of log buildings, and they're described uh, by those terms. Uh, and this, the second word gives the kind of construction detail, saddle notch, and so forth. The expression, a real lumber house, was, was a common term. And in, in implies the aspiration of person uh, waiting for and thinking, planning on building a real lumber house. Under that, I've written three types of building systems that were used here. Uh, then below that, uh, I've used the term builder's guides. There's also the term pattern books. And it's quite a different term. It's used a great deal and often incorrectly. The Builder's Guide refers to the earlier, I think more intelligent, theoretical books. And the pattern books are kind of like the Sunday newspaper stuff. You get the whole works and you don't need to think. Uh, and below that, I've written uh, Astra Benjamin, whom I'm going to show some material on, and then a, an, a, an American magazine, the American Agriculturist. My material is on the early, is, is on the period about up to 1860, uh, uh, including log construction and, and some classical rival building. I'm not talking about styles very much. I'm leaving out the Gothic because Marion likes it. So Marion can have the Gothic. These, the first two slides I put on to kind of simplistically describe uh, some things about the 19th century. And what, uh, what I have, the uh, next, uh, there's a set of four slides here, which I took from a book in New York State, um, published in 1880, something or other, and a man named Turner wrote this book, and I wish I knew what was behind that, but, but uh, the, that's, that's wrong. Oh, well. The, the, what, the, what Mr. Turner did in his book, he described early New York State life, and he pointed out something I'd noticed here, and I was interested in seeing that was a phenomenon, is that each, uh, on each uh, property, the average pioneer built about three or four times. And he built first a cabin, uh, a, a, a crude kind of cabin, then a hewn lot house, and then a real lumber house. And these drawings of New York State are showing that, and they've gotten in the wrong order. A certain amount of literature assisted people. The literature is, is curious and interesting to look, up, look at. One's inclined to think that if literature exists, people used it, or if literature exists, it's intelligent, or if literature exists, it's innovation. And all three of those things are, of course, apt not to be true. But the, uh, the, the left-hand drawing is from the American Agriculturist, the magazine that began about 1843, uh, and it published articles relating to farming building, all scanning, all sorts of things, so washing, laundry, whatever. And the left-hand article is, is a very intelligent uh, article describing how to build a log cabin. It's, and it's showing, it's showing the construction. It describes the process. This was written, uh, the, the American Agriculture was published, published in New York City. It was written for Eastern people who were curious about the settlement of the West. This was in the 1850s it came out. 
and it describes it very accurately. What's interesting about that particular article, I think, is that the average person building a cabin didn't need an article because he'd done it already and, and was, 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 was probably quite skilled at it. It does point out, uh, which is true of construction in the 19th century, that various people had various skills. The, the sort of tradition of the, uh, of the uh, average person in the 19th century being a, a sort of jack of all trades things is kind of nonsense, I think, that people had, and had different skills. And we find in most house building that's not an anonymous builder, it's actually somebody who was quite skilled and somebody else was less skilled doing various aspects of the work. The right hand uh, drawing comes from Marshall's Farmers and Immigrants Guide, one of the many pieces that came out uh, dealing with uh, the pioneering in the West and so forth. And this, this is the, one of the few drawings in the book, and it's, it's called a, 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 a pioneer shanty. And it's, it's very interesting, I think, because it's absolutely useless as a drawing. And it's not a kind of thing one could, we, you could look at that and build. If you hadn't built before, that wouldn't help a bit. It tells you what it might look like, but not how to do it or how to put it together. And so it, in a way, describes the romantic aspect of, of perhaps of pioneering, or it describes the more, more, more tourist aspect, or you might also think it also describes a uh, situation where the the uh, uh, the person, the people reading it, already knew how to do it. The round the round log buildings, and I'm speaking of course of the 1840s and that kind of period, are are crude temporary buildings and were seen as such, and they were in the, and the system was never used for permanent uh, construction. The left hand drawing shows a kind of notching called saddle notching where, you, where the, the, the log is, is, is cut into either on the top or the bottom and then fits over the other one. If it's done like the uh, 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 upper two drawings, it, it, uh, upper two drawings it's the more unwise way to do it because the pocket will tend to catch water and, it, and, and of course it'll rot out quite quickly. But the buildings also were thought of being uh, uh, usable for, for a year or two. The, uh, Basil Longsworth, who built out near um, Alsey, uh, in his diary, described uh, like cutting, uh, building a, some kind of temporary shelter almost today with a couple of friends helping him, which is very quick. And while the, when the structure went up, the person was, of course, uh, in building it was also calculating where he cut trees and so forth, and that uh, helped him to, in effect, same time, clear land and build roads and, and fences and whatever. And in building this uh, cabin, he was also thinking immediately of building what he called a hewn log house. And that might be built the same year. He might start building his hewn log house, which, are, which is a much more permanent kind of structure, but still temporary. The right-hand slide comes from some book or other, and it's called Cheese Creek Ranch, and it's in um, uh, Idaho, uh, Iowa, I think, uh, Idaho, in Idaho. And it's, uh, it's, it's called a building on the Oregon Trail, kind of a hotel on the trail or something. But it's, it's a good example of a, of a log cabin. It's almost a cartoon of it, in, in effect. It's got one, one uh, manufactured piece that one bit a window, and then the rest is all round logs and, and rather crude uh, construction. The, the, the blanks are for me. Uh, one, there, there are in, in log buildings about eight different techniques. I'm not going to talk about them all. But one interesting one were, were the French techniques. And the left-hand lithograph is of Port Vancouver as it looked in 1853. Of course, it was 20 years old or so at that time, which was at Vancouver, Washington. And you see Officers Row it existed in 1853 as it does today in the fort, in the foreground and so forth. And you, you get, if you look at the building, you get some glimpse that you're using this, this system here. That with a, in, in, in Fort Vancouver, it's a square post and slash and slotted, and then the squared log would drop into it. You get kind of panel wall system. I think that was a, that was a French system used at or in Oregon City and in French Prairie near St. Paul, and we have no examples left in, that we know of. In, in, we can read about them in the earlier accounts, but they no longer exist in, on French Prairie or in Oregon. This is this is a report Vancouver reconstructed, of course, and showing that system. So this is actually a slide. These pieces have pins that go into that, and then they're pegged at certain places. You can see the pegs are not or pegs pegs through, and then the pegs through you know, to the different kind of panels on the wall. Uh, there are several techniques uh, used for this. This would be a person's second 
log house, a hewn log house. And it's, and it, it's, a, it's a log cabin too, but it's, its logs are all hewn. And that shows that these are they're flattened out on both inside and outside faces. Sometimes the top and the bottom are not flattened. And the bark is left, the bark is left on the top and the bottom. I think they did that so the uh, chicken might appear to us. That, that's not the bottom. To get these large or great lights in, in this sort of very square, square corner. That, that should be showing a full dovetail notch. The, the streets were doing a half dovetail on the flat edge here, there were several other kinds of numbers. This particular log cabin on the right stood in Douglas County. Uh, there, there are very few left around the state uh, or in log buildings. Uh, Douglas County has, has, has a couple, and Eugene, uh, Lane County may have one on River Road, still there, and so on. And they, this, and they would have perhaps a chimney of some sort, and Ian Douglas County used a lot of stone in this early building. And this is a, a one or two room building, probably two rooms in there, the all purpose kitchen, living room, so on. <coughs> the log cabin, uh, one important thing to say about, a couple of important things to say about log cabins. One is that we can't think that as a building type, it, it, it evolved here, it came here. People came here and built it, they built something they'd seen before. They're, they're, not, they're not invented here. They also are not the ancestor of the house. The house in Oregon did not evolve from log buildings. The house ideas were imported also. The, the log was just a, just a phase. A person might build a log building to, to look like a real house, but the opposite that, that would not occur. The, the log, another important thing about the log buildings is they also represent cultural phenomena. They're various types, and they represent people's background. They become important in terms of what type they are in terms of construction or type they are in floor plan. The first house in Lane County at Pleasant Hill, um, the, uh, Elijah Bristow's house, built in 1847 or something, looks something like this, and it's called a, a saddle bag. It's two log buildings put side by side. Uh, with sharing a chimney, and then the roof goes over the whole business. And here they fill in this piece here. Something like they're actually, they're actually two, but they often have two porches and four doors and, and so forth. You can see how huge the log is. These are, these are, and they're, and they're all cut down about five inches to and like the corner square and so forth. The other part of, of a real log building is always a stud frame wall with a part of the machine. The logs do not go up. They do in Scandinavian building, but we don't have that tradition here earlier. A good, good uh, shingle cap here early, early. If you can look at that and tell which way the wind comes from, it comes this way, the wind comes from the opposite way, and the roof is cap. Another kind is a dog trot, which is a is two buildings with a passage between, and the passage between is a, an open porch. It might have a well on it. And and you did the dishes on it and so forth, and the buildings again are like each other, and they have porches on two sides, and there may be a staircase in the dog trot or a staircase in, in both rooms. In Aurora, one of the first buildings built in Aurora, Dr. Kyle's own house, which was this building here, built about 1860 and destroyed by a fire in 1926. This, this, this is a dog trot here, and it's just they finished off the house later on, and there were porches on here that Last, like a huge log building, perhaps one of the biggest ones in the state. This building still stands in Aurora, the Stopper Log House, uh, which is a two room house for the in Chimney. And the photograph on the left is a different building, but these, these buildings are almost always in the staircase in the corner by the chimney, which is right here, and that's where that staircase would be. It's an enclosed staircase, winding up. If you, the, the, that's, if you, that photograph of the staircase could also be in a real lumber house the same period. So from the photograph of the staircase, you can't tell which kind of building it is in. You see it says that the attic, again, is a sun wall with a car on the outside of it. That's, that's typical of construction. This building is built in 1869. This is a stock house. It's open to public in the summer. This is a, a drawing I made, never finished, of the Birdsey Log House, 1856, in Rogue River, uh, Jackson County, which still stands. And the photograph there was taken in 1938, uh, looking at this direction, this, this room. And you see the, the, this has log, log sills, and wood floor, and a fireplace, and the wood floor over here, the staircase going up there, and 
here. So what we have is here you know, uh, you know, walls and stuff that gives it a department of and so forth. The inside of this is then papered, and that photograph in 1938 shows the paper. It's a, a very good, and the photograph is interesting uh, also because uh, any building of the period might look like that. So we don't, the, the finish uh, doesn't necessarily make it clear what the construction is, or the construction doesn't necessarily lead to certain kinds of finishes. And this, this is wallpaper actually over lots. So the, the furniture in there is interesting too, the piano came around the corner and, and, and so forth. This, this house has been in the family since, it's still in the family, Grizzly family, since it's been built. Grizzly house again, uh, upstairs, uh, with upstairs bedrooms, whitewashed walls and, and boarding down ceilings. And this house uh, was built for the second block building, built on property, uh, and, and normally one expect it's going to be demolished and, and replaced by a house, but this is a remaining uh, and family gradually elaborated the tenants, bay window on the front part uh, in the 1870s, and they added this wing on the 1860s going out the back, and the bridge and the pantry, and the kitchen and dining room. Made it, made it bigger. bigger and bigger. This is the, this is a, this is a, Mrs. Briggs here, 1900, and the house. You can see that the main window there. There's a stone plant coming out of the plants frozen in there, so she had stolen the main window from the plants. You can show the plants. Uh, and then the, the, the front of the house, which faces the road, was over a period of time made to look. I mean, this is like a real house, and one thing they did was, was um, put strips on. These are bevel strips, and they covered the joints from the big logs, and then whitewashed the whole thing, and then the smelling grew coarse, the class of porch would come through. So the distance of those said were a real lumber house. <coughs> Other log buildings were demolished or used for barns or, or pulled away from chicken houses or whatever. This is the largest log building in Oregon, the standing at the moment. This is in Phoenix, Oregon, the Culver House, uh, built in 1855, used as a fort and various kinds of things. It's also a stage station uh, kind of concept, but was never used for that purpose. And a stage station has three front doors here, so that the ladies call in their stall and send a pass to the evening. And the inside of this building is, is, is all log up to here and back there. It's 50 by 50. It's a huge building. The, the logs in this corner here, you uh, can see the construction, a rather remarkable construction. This is the house. In terms of uh, building a real number house, people would, uh, of course, maybe within five years, uh, build a real number house, or three years, or 25 years, or whatever the case, case might be. And part of that depends on, uh, of course, their finances. Another part depends on technology. This view of uh, Scott's Mills in Fox County shows a, a, an early sawmill. You can all recognize their horizontal and twisting up with a vertical. You can see the machine and so forth. And if the arrival of these mills, these sawmills in the rural area, was one thing that made a possible person build a real number house. And I put on the left the, a view of the Reinhardt house that sat across from Albany. It's a big, huge house. It was possible in that period. All the lumber in that, those buildings, of course, would be. Uh, would be would contain, a building like that would contain a lot of hand hewn lumber, like the frame, the floor frame system, a lot of sun lumber, and then the lumber so would all be hand planed and hand, all the buildings hand shaped and so on. Uh, this the progress of uh, early building was also affected by the arriving of the sash and door factories. And here's the grounds of the session door factory from the Moyers, this is the Moyers earlier house with no longer standing in the mill and so forth. These, uh, while the earlier period, people had might have mills shipped in from from Portland or somebody little kind of big mills by I'm, I'm sorry, windows by hand or doors by hand. The uh, later period began to have uh, doors and things made separately, doors, shutters and and uh, pickets and uh, various pieces of trim and these could have been made by the mill. And this is a, this, this this in a way accelerated the building, gave a little more a little more uh, uh, choice perhaps. Um, and the, the door on the left is a, is a door of the 1850s, which you can recognize by the two vertical planks and the hinges too. Uh, this little brownstone house no longer stands 
I'm going to be talking about Brownsville in a bit later. There are around the state certain pockets that are left with him of, of, of interesting early architecture from Brownsville one. And Brownsville is, is this curious kind of uh, quality of the little cottages that look so like that with the door in the front. They're very tiny buildings. And they have this gorgeous detail. It's, it's somebody, you can see it there, and it's, you can see it there. Somebody in the locality but love making buildings even though the, the economics are so low. An impact on building, but also the, the uh, builder's guides, and this is one of Astro Benjamin's uh, books and the title page and so forth. The title page gives some sense of what was in this book and the, and the thrust of the book. These came out from the 18th century uh, onward, and one of their features was often uh, uh, the classical order. It was used in the classical orders in showing how to use the classical orders in terms of the forest and system. So if you have a column this diameter, then that mode is that. Is that meant for minutes? That's, that's the ratio of the, of the column diameter. So a whole portion system could be developed. And various writers have various theory about that, theories about that. And that was one of the major uh, content of these, these books. And they're very important. It's very important theory, very interesting theory. It requires uh, people, to, a person to think using it, to kind of think about how tall your building is and, and various things like that. And then, of course, you have to also uh, or think about what you can do in terms of your tools or, or, your, or your skills. And most of the work was being done by hand, perhaps, until in, in the 1860s. These books uh, uh, had other things in them. They had, they have, we have the classical orders especially. They, and they have pieces of buildings that have a, might have a page or so on just profiles of moldings. Some of these moldings here elaborated more. They would show the profile, might show what it looked like. They might also show you how to how to use a compass and drawing tools to make various curves. They might also show you how to cut it uh, in terms of assembling it. They do that with mantel pieces, staircase handrails. Uh, staircases, they're handrails. Uh, some nice complex framing systems. So a lot of their material was practical. They, and they would also have a few building plans, but not very many. And there's not much sense uh, in most localities or in Oregon that in the early period, people took building plans from books because we don't see, see much resemblance between the plans and the books. The uh, I think to say about these uh, books is they were written for uh, probably rather complex audience, but part of the audience were, were carpenters and builders, people who actually built, could use them to build, or people who were designing either, either one. They also were used over a long period of time. Most of them had, had a, quite a long history, maybe 30 years, this book might be republished long after the author were dead. So, there's a, so they have an um, ambi ambiguity almost in terms of to what extent we could think of them encouraging innovation, uh, uh, you know, a currency, and what extent they might be actually encouraging convention or, or tradition. And of course, for the builders in this period, uh, uh, the, the builders themselves might make a distinction about that where they might see innovation as one aspect, but they would, the innovation for them would also depend upon using traditions about a building. The carpenters uh, were people who were apprenticed in the age of 13 or 10, until they were about 21, went through a whole long period of apprenticeship. And that's, that, that tend to ensure quality, and it tend to also reinforce practic common practices and conventions. These are, again, from various books uh, showing molding, various molding systems and so on. Uh, the the right hand one, the staircase is the staircase. The the, uh, the staircase is a drawing staircase. See, it's a staircase. However, this 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 uh, detail here, the blue kind of form on the edge of the staircase, was used in Oregon up in the seventies. When we find it used as plain cutouts, and we find it also carved. This handrail, uh, the, the oldest house in Lane County, which is the uh, William Stevens House up in Dean Farm Road, 1851, has a handrail that does that kind of detail. But we, when we don't, can't really say that you use this book, the, the carpenter, but you could say that that kind of handrail was, was a tradition. Owen oh, Biddle's uh, little plan at the bottom there, uh, of using that, that we see, we see the plan, plan like that, it looks very similar to the Coleman front staircase, which goes, which went around like this, and it's two rooms, and there are a lot of houses like that. And the, the, uh, well, the builder's guides were sometimes showing plans that are innovative, and sometimes showing plans that are convention. So the fact that the Coleman house resembles a fiddle book uh, doesn't mean he used it, 
may that may have plans for the current various reports. John Ferguson built his house on the left out near Monroe in 1869. That's the plan of it. And I came across this in the American Agriculturist, 1846, of a book of Robinson, who wrote the magazines a lot on agricultural matters. And he recommended this house here, which to me had some resemblance to that. And it may, it may have made John Ferguson a carpenter, and he may have, uh, he may have, he may have gotten the American Agriculturist people in the one and now we're subscribing to this magazine. He may have gotten it and may have given it to you for his house. This, this, the argument of this house, uh, an argument, two arguments are interesting. One is that the, the house could grow by keep on adding on to it, could grow up and have to And the other was that having this porch uh, across the front, two story porch, and where you could go out in the, in the spring and smell the blossoms. Another source for house ideas were actually. Curiously enough, the building shipped in from Maine. And this is a house in Oregon City, which both these houses still stand. And there are a number of them. They're along the Columbia River. Uh, the left hand one's at Knighton House in St. Helens, 1850, I think it is 51. And the, the uh, uh, McCarver House in, in near Oregon City is 1850. The McCarver House, uh, Mr. Mc Kirk John McCarver, uh, was in San Francisco and bought the lumber for the house being shipped. The, the uh, lumber companies in, in Maine loaded ships with uh, miners and also parts of buildings. And it's not really clear what those parts were. It appears that those parts were, that were the right amount of lumber for some kind of a house and, and windows and doors and so forth. But they may have been pre-cut and they probably weren't pre-fabricated. The same companies had sent houses to Hawaii uh, in the 1830s. But they came to San Francisco because there was not the lumber around there and the miners were busy mining and stuff. And then they, uh, in San Francisco, and there were a lot of them built in San Francisco. And then when they didn't sell there, they were sent up the coast and they were built, some were built in Olympia, Washington, and Steelacoon, and, and, and those kinds of places. And then a few drifted up the Columbia River. Portland built one or two. The first house in Portland was one of these houses. Nathaniel Crosby's house. Anyway, they were here, here they are here. And we don't know a lot about them, how much, what's, we would, would like to speculate to how much the, the way the building looks is actually, was, was uh, inherent in materials uh, and how much this is. It looks like a New England house, of course, in lots of ways. This one doesn't quite so much. How much it is, this was the, uh, the design was actually imported or whether actually a person could rearrange materials to get something else out of it. This, there were a few of these down a, a number of Oregon City, maybe just six or eight is what Oregon City, and maybe 10 or 12 in Portland. A few of these done, and they don't have a great lasting impact, and the, the period of importation didn't last more than two or three years. The left-hand slide I put on to just demonstrate that the, the, this is the uh, Woodruff House in Douglas County, the building that didn't know where stand, but in the background, the little blotch in the background is the log cabin I showed earlier, log house, and then in 1883, they built this real rubber house and brought it kind of forward to the site, and, that, and it, that's about a 20-year interval between one and the other. The right-hand building uh, sat in Oregon, in, in, I'm sorry, in Albany until, until uh, up about 1910 or so. And this was the Reverend Miller House. And what's interesting about this, of course, the octagon, it's, it may be the only octagon house. It was built in 1851. Reverend Miller had lived on the uh, Hudson River uh, and, and visited a friend there. And the friend on the Hudson River, according to history, gave him the design for an octagonal house and he came to Oregon and built it. But what's fascinating about that is on the Hudson River, was living Orson Fowler, who wrote the book on octagon houses. And you know, it's whether, it's whether it came from him directly or not, we don't know. This uh, plan, this building so fascinated people in Albany, they copied the house uh, for their first courthouse, the second courthouse, and it also buried. Some, some, many people's houses, of course, came from uh, they're, they're probably most houses from their traditional ideas or ideas back home. And these both are Virginia, Virginia type buildings. The right hand one is, a, is actually a building in Virginia. There was a one or, there were one or two like this in the state, but one on Sally's Island that no longer standing the chimney outside. 
and we see many uh, uh, like this with a blank wall in the end, which also is kind of a southern type. The left-hand house still stands <coughs> north of McMinnville, the uh, Thomas Jefferson um, Shadden house. And, and Thomas Jefferson Shadden came from uh, around Virginia. And of course, it's kind of a Thomas Jefferson looking building. So we sort of imagine he brought the idea with it, too. People uh, would also say that they copied their, their house back home. This is the James Meachman Anderson house on the right, which stands near Jefferson in, in uh, Marion County, built in 1855. Uh, the family is still, still in the Anderson family. The Andersons came from Ohio, Fairfax County, near Lancaster. And Mr. Anderson told me that they had copied their house back home. And they gave me the location of it and so forth. So I went and looked in Ohio. And that's what was, that's, that's the house on the left. So sometimes these are just traditions that are, that are not really valid. There are, there are some similar characteristics in the house. That house is still in the family, too, in terms of this, some detailed characteristics, but nothing, nothing special. Other people, the Caleb's who lived out near, whose house was out near I-5 in the Beltline, built this house in 1873 in, in, in Eugene. Uh, and their tradition was that the house that the Elmer Caleb in 1872 had gone back to Washington Village, Vermont, and his mother built a new house. He copied it with left-hand pictures of Washington Village, Vermont, and the Caleb house is on the left. And you can see they're similar. The Caleb house in, in Vermont was raised to two holes of curries a bit later. They cut off, cut it, cut it through here, pushed it up higher, and you can see the same composition. So that, that is a story. And there are other ones like that. This uh, section is a quick run through. Uh, uh, human construction, uh, and, which you're probably all familiar with. And if the right hand, these are from Sloan's book, that shows, shows a, log being, uh, a, a log being squared off into, into a human piece. And the left hand drawing shows the last phase of the barn raising. A certain number of early houses were of, human, of these versions of this human system. And that means it has horizontal pieces, the heavy ones go around the edge of the building, the sills, and the heavy ones that go around the eaves, the, the, the plates, and the corner posts, and the intermediate posts would be hand hewn. All the big pieces there would be hand hewn. Probably in the, from the 1840s and 30s, 40s into the 50s, uh, we find most of the construction would be hand hewn. And then in the 50s, we find the other two systems of, uh, appearing uh, quite early the balloon frame system and the, uh, and the plank and box system that we'll talk about later. This uh, again shows a shows a human system of the, the kind of compartmentation that, that these buildings make. The Monteith House in, in uh, Albany is, is a human frame system. The right hand drawing is, comes from the um, Carpenters Com Company book of Philadelphia, an 18th century book, uh, and it, the, the Carpenters Company companies put out books of, of, of various cities, put out books to standardize construction in reunions, like the unions way, to standardize the quality construction, and also to standardize the prices. So they give lists of materials. And from those lists, we can tell, of course, a bit what terminology was in the period, and what buildings, what elements buildings had, and so forth. And they have also a few drawings in it. And this, this in elevation of a building is, is a, what was that type of book? This, 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 the system is interesting. The, the Eve system is somewhat like the Garvey system. And this second post system, uh, I've only seen that once in a, in a mill in the uh, state of Washington. But these, these have human pieces that needs to be would be rough side. This is the, uh, the Cartwright House, which sat near Lorraine. It was destroyed. But the owner had it pushed over with a cap and destroyed. And the, the, the window from it was the one that used to hang by my office on the third floor. It's still up there. But that, that's the Carmen House. It, it was an extraordinary construction. It, this is the Monteith House, and all of this showed the construction of the kitchen, uh, section of the kitchen, with a lot of joists and a lot of joists with a top line and huge pieces and middle pieces. And the inside, that doesn't show the house and she's the inside finished with a horizontal board and then kind of wings got sitting <coughs> and the ceiling finished with a board and pattern. The left hand uh, shows a house the same period, 
uh, kitchen corner in some rather nasty colors. But the the uh, the, the, the thing the thing I want to want to say about the if you if you are interested in construction and look inside the building, it's practically impossible to tell which construction system it it, it is of. Whether it's human frame, box, or glue. It's being a bit simplistic. Difficult. They tend to finish off like this. Most of the houses in the 1850s and 60s were finished off with boarding, and, and the boarding was sometimes all finished boarding like this, so probably painted. Sometimes the, the, the wainscot was finished boarding, and the ceiling was finished boarding, this stuff would have been involved in this piece. Uh, once in a while, the house was plastered, but plaster was very rare and very difficult because, of course, the materials for plaster were, were important. This is one of the houses of, in the Belknap settlement here, Monroe, the house no longer stands. It's really photographed of it and then photographed all the ruins. This building is in the blue frame system. The blue frame system is an innovation uh, going toward using more millwork, using lighter pieces and, and simpler pieces, and uh, reducing the number of people involved in construction theoretically. The, the, the basic difference in it is that the, the studs will run full height here, and so so plate across this piece here. You can see this has one on by here. At this juncture where the second floor comes in, there's a um, ribbon piece put uh, not in the sense as in the joints, joints sit on uh, the cross. That was the system. If you, uh, these, uh, uh, these systems kept reusing some of the same early elements. The subfloor of this would be the same heavy wooden frame uh, system. If you could crawl under the building, you wouldn't be able to tell which system the, the, the walls is on. A. Mr. Bell put out uh, I, one, of those, one of those sort of builder's guides books on showing blue construction. I think it's 1858 or so. Uh, Oregon was using a uh, balloon frame system before, before that day. There's a uh, theory that balloon frame developed in Chicago in 1834, which I think probably is not correct or not quite complete because the Oregon was using it in 1851 or so, and I don't think they would have gotten ideas from Chicago. That this the drawing shows the balloon frame system, and you see, you see the studs rise in full height. The, the end of the building, the floor pictures, which shows the, the sill at the bottom, and then the stud with the two full stories, and you see behind it the second floor joists, the second floor joists here, and they rest either in the building on this wooden or ledger piece that's cut into the, to the, to the front, uh, front hall of the joists. You can see the wooden there cut into the so that, that's the system. The system talked about using lighter pieces uh, and, and two by four and so forth. Here's a house that's probably still standing in your cottage grove, built in the late 1860s, and it's a it's a little frame, but all the pieces are, are four by fours and they rise full out of the building. The sills hang here, this these boards are knocked out here, and if there's a second floor joist coming in, there's a second floor ceiling in, and a second floor floor. The, this system, uh, because of the, of, the, of the length of the pieces, tended to go with uh, Gothic Revival and tended to also, which is the same, same, same thing in the way, to encourage them to get longer and vertical. We start to see them get narrower and taller and then perhaps you probably will because of that system. And this is just a sketch I made here that shows the rhythm is not in the top wall across the PhD ceiling floor there. The, the left hand is, is actually, picture is actually the Hanley House in Jacksonville. I'm throwing a few interiors here. And one reason I'm doing it is, uh, I'm going to talk about it a bit, but it's also to point out that in terms of these various construction systems, the interiors uh, we tend to go be independent of the construction system. And, and I don't know if the handy house, frame, the handy house might be balloon actually, but uh, where it has uh, plastic wall and wallpaper and, and so forth inside of it. That could be, that could be any, any of the system. This is the plan of the, of the uh, Chapin house, the house I've been showing in your cottage grove. And what's interesting about the plan and the reason I'm showing it is that the plan is very conventional 
uh, in some ways, although it's rather stylish. It's a Gothic plane from the good thing that it's all in this T-shape of Florence. But it's also a dog trap that passes that passes the kitchen and then you have to set the building and the living room across the front. So it's using a very conventional, traditional plan while it's using a very innovative and advanced construction system. And we find those differences in thinking occurring a lot. People, person would think about its construction somewhat differently than you might think about the form or the plan system. The third system uh, is box construction. Box, the term box is used in Oregon, Washington, in the Northwest, and in the American South. A very old system, and not a lot is known about it. It goes back to the 18th century, at least, you can trace it back to sort of Viking construction. Where basically, the system uses planks, vertical planks, for the, for the walls, and no studs, no posts of any sort. So you just a very thin plank, plank wall. The left-hand picture of the Blakely House in Brownsville during demolition shows the planks. You can see it, the house is in a fire, and you see the planks, uh, vertical planks, and the paint lines are where the horizontal siding was nailed against. Usually they're finished off the horizontal siding, and when you drive around and look, you can't tell uh, which system it is. You can't inside either, but usually. And then the trim is put over it. And the, and the finish, the, 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 the boxing around the eaves, the rake and the eaves, and so forth, which made this a classical vinyl house, the trim will indicate, the trim will be able to accomplish any kind of style and may be interested in it, but the system itself uh, um, is independent. This is a, a different bill here showing the system. Here's a heavy hewn uh, subfloor of logs and so on. And then the, uh, the sill mount is this, this plank, an inch and a half, a fifth of stick, up uh, you know, against the plank goes up, and then the top is a cap, and the door is pressed on top of it. Quite often, every 10 feet or so, these, these joists would be a heavy hewn piece, perhaps to give the building a bit of weight. But the finish detail is the same as any other building. A remarkable system because it took, it took uh, less lumber and less nails than any other building system. And of course, in, in this country, we don't need to think about saving lumber, perhaps. People, people did. They're also very stable systems. It's a curious system, of course. It, it tends to suggest poor quality construction. And we find it being used for poor quality buildings like chicken houses, and we find it being used for mansions and by, good, by very good architects. Uh, this, this is a, a sketch I made uh, showing, showing the system, the grid, the sill, and the rock foundation, and so on. And the, and the plank coming down, the way it's not here. And this uh, is a house being demolished. This house was built in the 1880s. The system, this system was used up until 1900, probably, to be outlawed now by building codes. And the blue frame system used the same time. So, that, so from 1860 onward, you might expect to find that building being built either in box construction for balloon construction and not in any of these systems. And that, the, the siding has been taken off that building and you see the vertical planks. And behind, behind them, up to about here, so you can never call the human sail not to be able to see. And it then rise above well, this one from all the information that I have This is a drawing of the top. And so here's the plank coming up, and this board is nailed in the top of that. And the joists are sitting on it. This joist is an 8 by 18 piece sitting on top. This is a real house. <coughs> and that's, that's a house being demolished. And, and it's a rather complicated photograph. But what we're looking at is where the kitchen porch used to be, and the kitchen and the wall between the inside and outside here. It's, here's a plank wall going up. This house was had black and plastic inside. It was all glass and plastic. And the side and the outside is the wall had three, uh, three elements of the surface and then the human. So uh, so one system that was used, the, the best system, this is kind of called called feathering or using a tongue. And this, this is a plan of plants, the size is happy, but the, this is an inch and a half plant, so if I can say it. And then it's not the lower edges, and then these spines are driven down. See that this one's split here. Here's, here's one that has a kind of split the spine coming down. That, that makes the wall very rigid. So the wall will pop up. Spot and spot. These systems are, 
interesting also is one thing about them, whether they're a technical phenomenon or a cultural phenomenon or, or both. And uh, my sense of that is that they're, that they're actually a choice in part of the builder in terms of part of the cultural preference. He preferred to do the system, preferred it. We find it in pockets uh, in, in Benton County. There's a, there's a pocket of it in Kings Valley, which in this house is in Kings Valley. And, but, but west of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Corvallis, in, in, uh, southwest Corvallis, in uh, near Monroe, but we find very little of it. We find more of the box, box system, uh, more of the uh, balloon system. So we get these groupings of things. Then we also will find, probably in any community, some uh, examples of both, of both systems. This is the Watson House, the oldest house in, in Benton County. It still stands in the case now, built in 1851, show, showing various, this is either drawing showing the stages in the box building. But here's the, here are all the walls around and all the three partitions. This is an outside porch here, another porch back there, and the various rooms of the chimney go. And these these going out to the second floor level. Above the second floor, the wall is a stud wall. And that point of view shows that stud wall uh, in place. These, these, are, these are both box buildings. The left hand one's, one's now a little tiny building in, in uh, Polk County, uh, who is one, one room and so forth, box construction. The front, the front porch had exposed the, the vertical planks and made it board and batten to make it kind of pretty. And the side walls had horizontal siding on it. And this is the concert house in Jefferson, uh, which is quite a big house. The, the slide's kind of foreshortened, actually, but it's across the front of the house. And this is also box construction. And I'm showing it to just illustrate a couple of things. One is if you look at the building, you can't really tell which the system is. But also, we see that in terms of the quality of the workmanship here, that whoever built it was interested in very high quality quality workmanship in the computer. And now, whether the same person did the trim and the construction, of course, not know. These columns are included. I think there's only one other building in Oregon, Oregon in the period, actually, actually included columns. Most, most columns are built up and not through so it's quite unusual, quite unusual building in terms of quality of woodwork uh, associated with this rather simple construction. I'm using this set of slides to show uh, rather quickly the work of, of a building. There are other buildings we 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 could get get the collections of their buildings talking about their work. Uh, this is William Pittman who built this. This is a Watson house, which we saw a minute ago, but is a box construction house. Built this house when he's about 25. He designed it 25 or 24 and did the construction in 1851, the oldest house in Benton County. And this is a plan of it and the appearance of it. He built a number of houses in Benton County, and then he moved up to uh, Dallas, Polk County, and did buildings up there. Then he moved back to, uh, to Benton County, to Cottage, to Corvallis, and uh, built a brick building, ran a furniture store, and I think he's involved with the Gulfin City Water Power and Sashen Door Factory in the in, in, in high But, but anyway, so we went through that kind of evolution. The point of that is part of that many of these, many builders in this period would build for a certain period of time and then change, perhaps to a later profession. That might, might build in a period of buildings uh, auspicious and then shift to some other, other technique. <coughs> this is the plan of the house here. It's, it's, it's all, all these all these walls are, are board board construction and finished finished uh, to be uh, be painted. Uh, this room here has a thicker wall uh, version of it, and this uh, this uh, sorry side of the but this uh, wall actually was wrapped in plastic, and the family set of it, which is a very curious or rather amazing remark, they said that, they, that this was the first class of roof in, in Oregon. I don't know how they could how they could. Uh, arrive at that information. These are other buildings at the Norton House that uh, William Pittman designed and built also in the Isaac King House that was designed. All, all the box construction. What's interesting in his work is that in the building buildings are, are all kind of a classical detail and detail changes quite a lot from building to building, you know, suggesting he enjoyed thinking about detail and the plans changed quite a lot too. Other builders would build a building, build the same plan type over and over again. And he, and he did the Lyle House in, in Dallas and the County Courthouse in 1859 in Dallas.
there are, are another, uh, there are around the state several pockets that are of early architecture that are interesting. Jacksonville is one. I didn't bring in any slides of Jacksonville. Douglas County has a, a lot of early buildings, but they're scattered. Um, and of course, the Mission Mill in Salem has a number, <coughs> and Brownsville has a number. The left hand Gothic building in Brownsville no longer, no longer stands. And the right hand building, the Hugh Fields House, it does stand, but the terrific woodwork's been covered with aluminum uh, stuff. Um, I want to, what I want to point out uh, about them is again that, that extraordinary woodwork, like the, the left hand building, the, the detail around the upstairs window, for example, which indicates a different porch design originally, but wonderful kind of, kind of a rather inventive woodwork. And this building here, uh, which is a, of course a classical temple, a once for a temple building, uh, is also in a way rather, rather gothic, rather, rather curious building. The, the, the detail you see right all around the eaves is that uh, kind of a <coughs> sort of gothic sort of detail, certain detail. They, that piece is cut out of a quarter inch board, they cut boards down to a quarter of an inch, and then glue them on and do that, do that kind of detail. And then around the door, there's different certain detail, and the windows here, then across the back of the porch uh, was wainscot. Wainscot is the same as inside the house, kind of outside here, and then uh, 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 posts to build up. The Blakely House in Brownsville was destroyed some years ago. And this is here, it's typical of Brownsville, but it's these little tiny houses, maybe two rooms in the main part, which you see there, and, and a wing in the back, which has been demolished here, and one and a half stories, and so forth. And they're all uh, box buildings, plant, beautiful plant walls, very simple walls. And it's an extraordinary uh, exterior detail. And here it's, a, uh, it's, it's sort of a kind of haze and dark, and you playing around the leaves here, uh, again out of quarter inch board. Uh, tracing that detail back, uh, the, the, the uh, only place I can find it in life yet is in, in the books of Batty Langley, which were written and uh, published in the 1730s and 50s in, in London. Batty Langley published about 40 books on various things, a number on architecture. And we do know that, uh, that one <coughs> builder, actually the builder of the Sam Brown House in, in, uh, in Marion County, owned a, a Batty Langley uh, book. So it's, it's possible that that's a hundred years later, it's possible that the first people are using that. I use this in detail. Uh, the there are also pockets of extraordinary detail. That's the concert house again, in this, in this corner detail. Po pockets of craftsmanship that we don't know who did it. The um, same brown house, this is where the where the, one of the carpenters owned the Batty Langley book. If you go through that Batty Langley book, I think it's the one called The Carpenter's Jewel, uh, there's nothing about in the book that indicates the house. So you may have owned some other book, uh, except maybe that. So the here. One thing extraordinary about this building in this book was one is that it had a plate kind of system with a courtyard, two, two feet of standing wings behind it, plate courtyard. But the other is the uh, marble work of the, of the columns. I meant to, uh, when I was showing the Moyer house and the, uh, the, the Moyer Sash and York factory, talk about doors a little bit. I forgot to, to, forgot to do that. <coughs> it's, it's difficult for us to realize uh, what it was like for people in the 50s and 60s. Uh, building buildings in terms of the scarcity, sometimes of materials. Of course, the uh, more urban building would be more advanced uh, than the more rural building quite often because it's nearer to uh, material supplies. But one story that I read about is, is a sense of that scarcity. And a, um, a family in eastern Washington, somewhere in Whitman County or Walla Walla County, somewhere through there, uh, a pioneer in the 1830s described their house. And they set of it, which really rather amazing, that they, their house had the first door in town. You don't know what the other houses had, but had the first door, and, and you get a sense how scarce that door was. But then they went on to say that when the door arrived uh, at the house, the family had a debate about how to hang it. And what the, the problem was that the door was a four-paneled door, and four-paneled doors usually have two short panels and two long panels. 
they couldn't decide whether to put the long up or the long down. <laughs> another another uh, uh, wonderful thing running through this period, of course, is some of the, some of the finish, finishes found, found in buildings. And these are both examples of, of grain from the 1850s. The left-hand one is on the James Meacham Anderson House that I showed before, and we'll show again in a few minutes. This is in the, in the power that these beautiful doors, uh, and, the, and the, these doors are, are grain uh, to look like walnut. The, the grainer, the grainer would be one craftsman. The house, a house would have several craftsmen. The staircase might, person might be a special craftsman, the person making the doors or windows, special craftsman, the painter, special craftsman in the, in the finer buildings. But this is grain to look like walnut uh, in, a, in a very good kind of uh, quality. Sometimes the grain is so well done that you can't tell that it's not the real wood. The wood of that door actually probably is cedar. Cedar is what was usually used. And the, the, the period, this period never, uh, almost never used natural finishes. We don't find, find wood walls that are natural wood or oil wood. They're always painted, or, or, or they are real wood. It's real wood made to look like real wood, which is kind of a, a neat uh, situation. The, the, the graining runs through several, uh, has several qualities of the graining. As a kind of quality, or as I see it, this kind of quality, kind of quality where the graining looks exactly like the real wood. You, have, you go touch it, and still you can't decide whether it's a piece of cherry or it's not. Then there's a grain that's kind of a, where the worker work is kind of tired, and just kind of does some grain. Uh, the Wolf Creek grain, uh, I was involved with restoration, Wolf Creek, Wolf Creek Tiger. Wolf Creek grain is more the tired type, where the person just kind of, kind of did it. I don't mean the restore, I mean the original person. Then there's a grainer who gets involved with kind of folk art. And the one on the right here, this house, this door is in the, uh, a uh, little white house at Rock Point in Jackson, Jackson County. And it, this is probably a cedar door, too. And then it's had a coat of, coat of uh, the, the very, very light paint, and the coat of yellow paint, and very cedar things that make it look like wood. And what's neat about it, of course, it doesn't look like any wood we've ever seen. For, it, 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 can't, it can't be that thing that we see. And it's a kind of coat of and so forth. Very beautiful workmanship. Then, then there are the, the left hand door is the Hanley House, about 18, that's about 1875. And, there, and this, is the, this is an Aurora. Aurora's buildings are, I'm not showing 
I was going to show them, but I decided to have time. But Aurora's buildings are interesting because it, it's interesting that Aurora's got an interesting collection of buildings. They're interesting to put in the, con in the context of the period because they're, they're, they had um, all kinds of special equipment and special workers. Certain people made doors, certain people made windows. They had lathes and, and, and good mills, and their buildings tend to lack detail. Very little detail is the, the, the Kyle House has beautiful turned columns <coughs> and, and turned spindles, but otherwise not very much. This is a, an Aurora Manor piece here, so quite a crude design. And the, 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 what's interesting is, is trying to understand to what extent the, the fact that people were from Pennsylvania and Germany and, 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 and sort of a, uh, uh, tradesmen, uh, people made shoes, and, and that gives their interest, or whether it's because it's a uh, one person doing most of the building, or whether it's because they have a lot of people to build for, or whether it's because they're very traditional. But the buildings in Aurora, as you, as you look at them, and, and, and most of their dates are around 1870. They look like uh, like uh, 1770. They're, it's amazing to have a utopia right by a railroad and buildings for convention. But this is an Aurora mantelpiece. It's a very crude mantelpiece with pieces. It's, it's certainly not out of those builders' kinds. It certainly isn't clearly classical, and certainly doesn't involve much craftsmanship or much much interesting design. But then it's got some extraordinary, extraordinary marble, marbleized work on it. In, in the, this early period, in the 1840s, 50s, uh, one uh, place we do see the builder's guys being used are for mantelpieces, uh, uh, some, sometimes. And often in a building, it, almost the only detail that looks like it's kind of withered or, or carefully done or is, is clearly cost revival might be the eaves uh, and then inside the mantelpiece. The left-hand drawing is one from 1839 of, of uh, Bachelor Benjamins, and the right-hand the, the damaged mantelpiece is 1854. That's 16 years later. <coughs> That's not, not really an amazing gap in terms of, because the book, of course, is being reprinted. And then the, the uh, uh, Ryan Hotel in Jacksonville, Robbie Collins' place, has the same mantelpiece in his building as what, 1860-something, so I think, it's, I think it's 25 years later, same, similar kind of detail. This is, Asher Benz is not the only person who published that detail, but once like he's got this, this fretwork and so forth at the top of this. Uh, uh, Menard the Fever published this, uh, on the left hand, this uh, Pollard wall detail. There's nothing like it in the period in, in Oregon that I know of, but there are maybe rooms approaching it. And the right hand the interior is actually in the James Michelin Anderson house. The woodwork has been painted white. Once it was marbleized and other kinds of things, the interior is plaster, but a rather extraordinary room. This is a, it and doesn't have the, the, the you know, a portion of the elegance or the, or the systematic workout, work arrangement that the uh, Minard and Fever does, but it is very interesting. These are, these are, these are all, I thought this was private when I first saw it. These are the glasses, and all the old things are, are framed by glass, and when they're close together, they just increase the size of glass. So Two windows here have one piece. I think there are, I think there are 12 or, or 13 guys that are going around the practice and around the foot and the treads and kind of blocking for us. Of course, a uh, very curious detail, but also quite, 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 a, quite a wonderful detail. This is, this is the, that house again. original site. It was down in the, uh, you know, the park blocks where the courthouse was. And it is a typical example of a little classic cottage, uh, very summarily treated, of course, but not bad. Uh, just a couple of rooms, really. 
And it, it uh, stood somewhere, I've never been exactly sure how, in relation to the park rock where the courthouse was. Well, it's a simple frame structure with, uh, you can't describe the order as being any one particular thing. Now there it is, after it was moved, the thing is, this is a little simple building could be picked up, put on a flatbed truck, and moved by the county, and it was. And it was, that's when it was in storage for a good many years, out in the county uh, storage area. Then it was moved a few years ago, back a little closer in the town, and it was uh, put up here, rebuilt. Uh, well, not rebuilt, because it wasn't demolished, actually, uh, at the Lane County Pioneer Museum. It has, a, it's unfortunately difficult to photograph now, because there is a tree in front, which has this strange pattern of branches. Some horticultural enthusiast uh, grafted the branches all together. It's like a ball of wool. And this is when the leaves are not on it, when the, when the tree is out and the leaf, you can't see it. Now that would be typical of all the classical buildings, and there was the courthouse. And you see it's a larger version, though hardly any more sophisticated than the little clerk's office. And it stood there in the one area of the park block, and it was replaced in the late 90s, the last 90s, and it is still replaced since by the present courthouse, which we'll see it later on. It is a, an effort to create a sort of Doric portico building. Very simple and obviously crude, but giving the impression of a classical temple. And what could be better than to do that for a county courthouse building? Here it is. It, it too was moved, and it was used as a high school. And uh, that, the portico disappeared somewhere. It was on the other end. You see where there's a prop there holding up the pro-style roof. And uh, we have another view of it uh, showing it in its later phases. And it does show some of the detail of the doorway and the window. And it has, of course, the typical classic revival. This is the back end. And here is the front. And of course, there were those four columns. Uh, it was all along, and it was here. It was called uh, called the Yates Hotel. Must have been a very high class place indeed. <laughs> and it, people drove up to the mother hall. And uh, here's the doorway. You see, it's been altered somewhat, but it has a big, wide, spread door, double doors, side lights, and top lights. I don't know why. I don't know, I, they may have been there, but I, I didn't see it when it was in this state. However, it did last quite a while in that state, and uh, that was the story of the courthouse. Now, it's rather similar to this one. In fact, there were, there were a good many such courthouses in the classic temple front style. And this rather crude print, this is the one, the Polk County Courthouse in Dallas. And it's gone, too. It's interesting that it looks so much like the Eugene Courthouse. It was built about a year later, maybe. And in fact, the next courthouse in Eugene and the next courthouse in Dallas were similar. We'll get to that later. But it's rather an interesting thing. I don't know whether that happened any place else. And of course, I don't know the architect for these two buildings, but for the later one, it was Delos D. Near. Now, here is Jacksonville, where there was a courthouse of very similar character. <coughs> Though apparently, it did not have a freestanding portico. That's the corner of it there. And this is it over here. Let me see. Am I right? No. That's it. I'm guessing that. This is a view, one of many views of Jacksonville taken by Peter Britt, who is our most remarkable photographer. And he took a lot from this house, where we're going to see the house a little bit later. And I don't, I've never found a photograph where photos that are some print. And this is the prison yard here. And that's the courthouse yard. You notice that there is a fence and it is a stile to get over it because the livestock roamed about in these days. Uh, this is the sketch from the, 19th, uh, the 1858 of uh, Cooper and Dressel 
you know, important, and that's the public school. And the public school, you think, could be a court as well. No. <laughs> Similar. Uh, and I don't think there were others. The, the, the classic was a very popular and perhaps reasonably correct thing. I don't know about this. This seems to be extraordinary. It's, first of all, it's quite a lot more elaborate. It has a six-column freestanding portico. And it looks as though it might have been of stone. Though that, in fact, is a little bit uncertain. It was the penitentiary. And it was um, on the south side of Portland. I've been told that people could remember seeing some of the building there uh, long after it was out of use as a penitentiary. But that's the one feature of it, as you see. And then, of course, just to show you that not everything, even in the way of public buildings, was classical in that period. 1858, remember, there is a hook and ladder company in Portland, which was Gothic. And we're going to turn to the Gothic for Gothic cottages, uh, more likely than anything else. Now, you've seen the house on the left, which could be a courthouse, of course, but it isn't. And it was a private house, Captain Ainsworth's house. It has a, an entrance on the side, but that was quite common in other examples in the east and middle west. Now, it's in Mount Pleasant, and it dates from 1851 or 52. And here, on the other side, you see, a house of practically the same time, also in Mount Pleasant, which is a sort of suburb of Oregon City, the Morton Macaulay House. And this house, I think Bill Dolphus mentioned this the last time, but I'll go a little bit more. Mr. Macaulay went to California in the time of the gold rush, remember 1848, 49, and he didn't maybe bring back Miss school, but he brought back a house. He brought this house, and it was in pieces and it came around the horn. And you put it up here, and I think really only the front portion of it was that portion. And it is, of course, it's hardly recognizably Gothic, but obviously the proportions are different from the classic, and I think it's meant to be a Gothic cottage. It was probably manufactured, the pieces in Maine, shipped around, he bought it, picked up a good bargain, and erected it here on his uh, the state there in Mount Pleasant. But it's a very nice little house, later restored by Mrs. Powers, who restored the other house. Mrs. Powers has done a great deal of restoration in Oregon, and these two houses were both, she lived in them both, but I think she still loves live in the Morton McCarver house, which you're seeing here. It is rather now like houses that were shown in pattern books of the period, Here's one from Andrew Jackson Downing, whose uh, books were very, very popular. But this happens to be actually a slot made for the drawer in the Avery Library in Columbia, but it was reproduced in the cottage architecture of it. And another view of the of the parlor house here, with its piece attached to all the it. I think all this window and so forth and later, uh, but I don't know exactly where. Well, that is a design, and here's another one from Downing, a design that he described as a laborer's cottage. I said this was some interest, because obviously uh, this might have been a laborer. More than that next year. But uh, yeah, very simple. No elaboration, not a box corner, just the overhanging eaves, mm -hmm. nice little shed under the window. And very simple plan. One living room and a bedroom and perhaps an attic and club, you know, that you could use for sleeping. That shows the influence of Downing. And he was, in fact, one of the most influential of all 19th century publicists. Uh, here is another one. Uh, this is Downing, published in his book, after the architect Davis. And this is a little bit more elaborate, 
and it is uh, provided with several more specifically Gothic features that we've seen. In fact, that would be a hard time to find an example exactly like that in Oregon. First of all, there is one pointed window under a sharply pointed gable. And then there is a nice sort of open, almost delicate porch. And then, of course, there's something else that's very rare would be out here. That is the trusted chimney stack, as you see there. But coming rather close to that, as close as anything we have, would be the surgeon's quarters at the Dow, the Fort Dow. Uh, this is uh, really, truly a remarkable survival. The architect was a military officer, Louis Scholl, and this is the only surviving of building of the Fort Dow. And there were quite a few, barracks and others. What did it say? It is obviously a Gothic cottage with board and batten exterior with a little uh, sharp gable and uh, it doesn't have an arched window, but it has sharply gabled windows. Now in wood, that's much simpler to make than say to make the curvilinear form of the arched window, which is naturally a stone device, the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages didn't have houses like this, too pretty, too nice. Uh, they had castles and they had halls. And this is not exactly either. This is very, and it has nice, actually a sort of crusted chimney stack. It's a, used as part of a, it's a museum. It belongs, in fact, to the Oregon Historical Society. <coughs> operated there in the Dow, the surgeon's quarter in the Dow. Well, I think that is uh, really the one thing that you should look at, look at the doorway, and here is a detail of the chimney. The chimney that, is chi that is stone, a brick, and then it has board and batten facing. In fact, it's a very attractive house. One could easily live in it. It's quaint, pretty. It is, in fact, simple and obviously still appeals to the uh, high-thinking middle-class person, high-minded. And I would say that uh, there's a very interesting book, a novel, called Captain Gray's Company or Crossing the Plains and Living in Oregon by Abigail Scott Dunaway, who was a sister of Scott, who was the Oregonian editor for many years, and she herself was very prominent in the women's suffrage movement. Uh, this book describes the, her own life, really, in the form of a novel, as a live, coming across with friends. She was sort of alone in the film. And when she got to Oregon, she had to hire herself out. <coughs> Not unusual, of course. And she worked, she described working for somebody in a fine house. And if you, there are no pictures in it, of course. But if you know now that we've seen the, the Captain Ainsworth house, you realize that uh, that's the kind of house that she went to work for. But she didn't want that kind of house for herself, or that is for her. She has two couples, hero and heroine, two couples of them, and they have, there again, she never uses the term gothic, but it is clearly more like this. It's clearly a gothic cottage. And there we see in a, that print of Portland, and we come down to this, and here is one of the houses, <coughs> uh, the residence of Mr. Holmes, and this is exciting thing to see, and it has very simple design, steep roof, a quite large window there marking the entrance, a rather delicate porch, and in addition to the molding over the uh, arch window, we have these label molds. That's what they're called. Here at the side. They are, in fact, a, a def definite medieval detail, particularly associated with the late Middle Ages rather than earlier. But that gives a charming idea. And after her set, these young couples, they built some cabins for it. And then when they get enough settled, and not very long in between, they want a comfortable house, obviously a gothic cottage, something like this, 
would be what they would want. That's exactly what they were going to get. And, they, and we, of course, I don't know what one she had in mind, but it's obviously something of this kind. And there's another one uh, from that plan of the building, uh, building the portal, the Collier Robin. Now, I went to this because it has labeled moldings over the upstairs windows, and then it has uh, decorated barge boards. Sometimes they're called barge boards. That is really a medieval idea, but it was widely used on these simple cottage-like structures. And it is rather strippy, thin post below. Uh, that you can find quite a lot of places, and with a considerable variety and ingenuity in the barge boarding or birds boarding. Sometimes acting sort of interlaced. So that's gone, but I don't think that was interlaced. I think just gone. And over there you see a very pretty little cottage. And it's got, it's obviously in the east. It's more civilized, but the same general idea. And it is uh, got a little cultivated garden instead. It is the furnace piece of a book, another book, of rather considerable influence, a book called A Christian House, published in 1869 by Catherine Beecher and her sister, who's better known today, Harriet Beecher Stowe. And it gives all kinds of ideas about how, you know, it should be relatively modest and comfortable and very homely, as you can see. Well, I'll just show you some other. There is a house that belongs to the period, all right, the New Little House at Shampooy. It survived the flood of 1862, and it stood, when I first saw it, it was looking like this. And it, is a, it has a very steep gable, and it has just a square-headed window. And uh, actually, there's always a certain amount of perhaps classical influence in the detailing the Robert Newell house. And here is a detail of that gable. And it says that gives it its, go there's no obvious Gothic detail, but that's it. And here is the back of it, as it was a few years back, a few years ago. And here is the corner of it, showing the construction. And it looks as though we're just about to wreck. Uh, the good ladies, the DAR, decided to restore a house. Yeah. And of course, the ones down on the area where the park is are all gone. So they restored the Robert Newell house, which is true, has some historical relationship. I thought when I saw it printed like this, it was in too bad a state to even try to do anything with. But they didn't. And here it is, restored. And it's been pretty. And it has pretty little sort of imaginary garden in front of it. And that, of course, is the, uh, I think it's not very much like an original. However, there were lots of those houses, and that's it. This is the fireplace that was left up. Now, there were a lot of houses like that in Oregon. Most of them are gone, and there were a lot in Portland. And this is one in Portland. Uh, this was an Elliott House, the S.G. Elliott House, uh, in Portland. <laughs> Still there. And here is the house in Salem, before it was moved. This is the McMahon house, which uh, has been moved and, uh, to the south, was on the north side of Salem, by uh, David Dunaway, who is a collateral descendant of Abigail Scott Dunaway, and it is made it into a very attractive house. This was where it was before he acquired it and moved it. The Mc Judge McMahon house. It, it originally had a garden that went sort of toward the river, and it has a light sort of lattice-like porch around a, a, a pointed arch window above and uh, the, the detail of very pleasant character. It's curious how often the uh, Gothic type houses have these very trellis-like porches, very slender and not looking very insubstantial and of course entirely unlike anything that would have existed in the Middle Ages itself. And this is the John England Ross House, or it was, gone. Uh, Ross laid at the edge of Jacksonville. He was a famous uh, Indian fighter. 
and there was a Gothic cottage of this sort with several gables. And here is another one, and this is the Page Prim House in Jacksonville, which is a sort of cruciform plan, if you see it here. Uh, this belongs to the same general thing. Uh, the uh, same. This one was built about 1860. It is said that this is, was built by David Lynn. David Lynn has been the attributed author of a group of many houses in Jacksonville and other buildings. He was a master of carpenter and builder. And uh, his son, Fletcher Lynn, was one of the early graduates of the University of Oregon. And later, he had a furniture factory in Portland. And I went, one of my early trips to Jacksonville around was with Mr. Fletcher Lynn, who was then, I guess, about 90. This is another house in the, a little bit farther out in Jacksonville, the uh, Vinton Bell House. And uh, this is another a detail of it. Too many trees, but it's a very attractive little house that the Bell family provided the funds for Bell Hall on the campus here. We have a considerable number of contacts with uh, people in the Jacksonville area at the University of Oregon. Uh, perhaps no one has ever really been able to explain that. I don't know exactly why. But that's a very nice house. Set today, 1864. <coughs> and uh, here you have a house mm -hmm. that is like these, but perhaps a little bit uh, more elaborate. And this one is in California. Uh, this is the uh, house in Sonoma called Lacrimamontes, built for General Sonoma, and built in 1854. I mean, General Vallejo, who lives in Sonoma. And uh, this is very interesting with its barge board. I don't know that we ever had any quite so lacy in Oregon, but this is. And then we come to the uh, I got this out of order. Oh no, this is right. This is the this is the Brit House thing. And this is Peter Brit's house, built about 61, with additions about 81. And it was from this property that he frequently surveyed the town with his camera, and he also painted from this site. And this is still standing. There it looks better in an old photograph when the grounds, and he was an amateur horticulturist too. He was of Swiss origin, and this is the, the grounds of, of his house as it was some years ago. They were trying to make it pretty and comfortable and elegant, and also very domestic. So I compare it, although it, 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 the idea is there, it's not quite the same kind of construction. Peter Bruce's house has elegant large boards, a very delicate landslide porch. He had a studio in front of that part of there, back there, 81 rather than 61. And uh, he brought in some plants of somewhat exotic nature, including some palms, which are still to be found in the Brit Garden. The Brit Garden has been restored in a way, but it isn't really very much the way it would have been. Now, I'll show you this one because this is the idea, the spirit of it again. Uh, this is from a later edition of Downing. Uh, Downing was already, had, his book went through many editions after his death. He had an unfortunate, untimely end. He was blown up in a what's the river steamboat accident. And this is the 1873 edition of Downing, uh, which 20 years after his death, you know. And this is, is the title of it. It'll explain why it's short when I say it because it's to be proper, nice. A cottage for a country clergyman. And the country clergyman obviously was not a Roman Catholic, he had a family, and he could employ his wife and children in the embellishment of his cottage. And so he put all this rustic work around the Dalek. That's, in, that's recorded in the text, you see. I mean, if you take that off, that, that rustic work, you'll see a house very much like the one we were looking at, the business. 
the unborn coats and branches. I don't think it's, a, it's the spirit that we are seeing here. There's another view of the Brit House, and here it is again. And here you see the interlacing barge board, end gable, and notice that the windows have little label moldings here. The Gothic spirit and Gothic cottage type. It's a very charming house. And, alas, gone. Now, uh, moving down into, a little closer to the town, on the road, in fact, leading to California, uh, we have several interesting houses that do belong to this Gothic style. Uh, this area, I was going to show you was one that I didn't, I guess, bring in the slide that shows a general view of it. Uh, a couple of houses. This is the Bigman house right here. I don't know there were about three houses. And the Bigman house is the only one of that group standing. It was called Piety Road because the people along this road were all proper Christians. In fact, I think they were all Presbyterians. And of course, that makes them next to God, really. Here is the Beekman House, which is now owned by the Southern Oregon Historical Society and uh, used as a house museum. And it was left to the University of Oregon. Fortunately, we were able to persuade the university not to the exorbitant demand as the, I thought they should give it to the Southern Oregon. They didn't. But anyway, the Southern Oregon Historic Society was able to acquire it, and it's been pretty well fixed up. This is a piling road coming along here like this. There were several, I think there were four all together. And very pretty house, not as elaborate as the Brit house or some of those we've seen elsewhere, but very attractive in its way. There it is with better light. And they all had picket fences or some kind of offense because, of course, the livestock roam freely. This is the front. The main entrance is on the side here. Uh, it's a little porch tucked in the corner, and it does have very sharp gable and very attractive in its way. There's a side entrance, which would be in many of the houses we looked at the front. Very steep gable, and it's been furnished more or less as it was about the beginning of this century because they don't really have much of the furniture or the, exactly how it was when it was first built. So is this a transition from what? Gothic to Victorian? To what? I was wondering if it's looking more and more like Victorian. No, no, no. I told you don't you use that word Victorian without knowing what you're talking about. <laughs> and obviously you don't. All right. Do you know what so, you're talking about? I know what you're talking about, but you don't. <laughs> now, of course, it was built during the long reign of Queen Victoria, but that doesn't make it what ordinary people think of Victoria. We'll see that later on, and of course, it's true. Anyway, it's Gothic, although it has no pointed window, just the last porch, and of course, the, sheep, the steep gables are not fruit ones. This is typical. Well, we had some in Eugene. And here I'll show you. This is the residence of the F.B. Dunn in Eugene City. And very charming, as you must have been. See, very similar. And it, is, it doesn't have any pointed window either. Hmm? There it is. Hmm? Still there. But you wouldn't recognize it, even if you wouldn't recognize this photograph. And then you have this house that side of you. And this is the house of a man who was supposedly devoted to the history of the area, Cal Young. And that's this, this house that unfortunately allowed it to be destroyed after this. That's the way it was. That's a good example, but there's no more there. And it is a Cal Young. 
you know, he, uh, when I came here, he was still alive, but he was kind of an old codger, not to say old coot, in my opinion. <laughs> and uh, he was a great one for all, that's the trouble with people. Great ones, you know, for thinking of certain admiration of the past in this annual pageant that they had, at, where people, men grew beers and so forth in the day before that was so popular as now. And of course, it was given up that the time beers came back, but well, naturally enough, history was like that. But at any rate, it was a pity to allow this house to be destroyed by the firefighters for practice. <laughs> that shows how deeply knowledgeable and interested he was in historic architecture. <laughs> Not at all, I think. Uh, this is a house, I'll just show you two, because scattered all over the state, you can find some houses like this. Maybe there are not very many left anymore. Uh, this is the one that you see here in the Dalles, and this other one on the uh, that is in Tandy. Or, I think he said that just the pointed arch gable, maybe all that you'll find, and the steep roof part. That's it. Now we move on. A little bit quick. Well, here is the Peters Wintermeyer house, which I just got a slide mixed up here, but that's all right. This is a very good example of the kind of thing that is gothic without having a pointed arch window. But it has a little awning-like protections over the upstairs gable and the uh, little Italian brackets here. Well, I'm getting, you can't always separate this stuff. And this house was built in 18, about 1870. It was originally standing uh, where the present site of the Timbers, where the Timbers Motel is. And it was uh, there, uh, you may know the book by the Wilkins girls, the little sisters, uh, which one of the ladies still living, Nina McCormack, and uh, I mean Gladys McCready is still living, Nina McCormack and Lillian uh, Lucy, Lucy Moore are dead. And they wrote that story in Eugene, a fascinating book, and they described how Mrs. Uh, Frazier Brownell's mother went to call on Mrs. Peters when Mrs. Peters was an established lady and Mrs. Fraser was a young woman coming to Eugene to live. That took place somewhere perhaps around 1890. And the house was then, of course, downtown, it was moved, and it's been pretty well cared for. And a very attractive example indeed. The only one that is of that quality we have. Of course, some things are all those dormant windows and probably would not have been there in the shape. Now, turning to the next phase of domestic art, the Italian. And I'm taking it up uh, more or less by house type. We've seen the classic, the Gothic, and now the Italian. This based, of course, upon what was supposed to be Renaissance. But we don't really call this Renaissance. Those of us who know, we may call it Italianate and sometimes Italian villa style. The Italian villa style seems to better suit when the house is a little bit more irregular and massive than this one. This is an Italianate house, one of which you see was important, which you're seeing over there on the, the um, left. And this house is, in fact, an Italianate house, uh, which is much more sophisticated. First of all, it's masonry, a brick and stone, and in Newcastle, Delaware. But it shows the kind of thing that was wanted when they built that house. Once again, this is one of the prints from the surrounding border of the Google and Dressel view. It has a bigger foot, just to take it off and look like that. Uh, the features of it are, generally speaking, to have a low, and it would ordinarily be a low hip group, but sometimes it was even actually rather flat. Uh, but hidden, at any rate, from the observer nearby. And to have no gothic pointed arches, and no, perhaps not, not any, Classic revival detail. It had Italian-made detail, 
frequently combining round arched openings with square hedges ones, as you see here in the, this one in Newcastle, Delaware. And there is another one. This is a design, another one of the downing designs for a villa in the Italian style, which is dated his drawing of it, 1842. And that brings us to our first example we're going to hear. I didn't quite realize it. I pressed the wrong button again. Now that, the villa really is uh, a better term to describe one that has a tower. And it has this roof, that is it. And an informal plant. That's an And arcade and roof windows as well as single openings. Now here is one of the earlier examples of this standing in, in Oregon, and it is a very good example. It is the Benjamin Franklin Dowell House in Jacksonville. And it's the best example, I think, now standing of an early example of the Italian age, Merck. The Dowell House was built in 1859. Uh, it has, it's brick, and it has some marble detailing for the trip that came from relatively close by Jacksonville. And that's again unusual in Oregon. It originally had a flat or not visible roof. But it, in the course of a period of time, it wasn't kept up. And in the early 20th century, they put that hip roof on, uh, which is not unpleasant. It's not wrong, really, for an Italian night house. But it wasn't part of the original design of this house. What do you say? It had a low lift. And uh, the house is uh, really, it's very small. It's really almost a play out. It has one room on each side of a hall and a little projector in the back where you have a, you had a kitchen, though the kitchen was actually in the basement, and it was a kind of dining room. Now there is a design by Downing, again, uh, what she called uh, a Tuscan or Italian suburban villa, as built in New Haven, Connecticut, in 1844, and this house was built in 1859. I didn't say it's not uh, typical of some of the details, but here uh, is another bit. Uh, this photograph was taken after a large tree was cut down, so you can see it a little better, although I don't think it's going to be better as an example of the house. And there is a side view which shows this little extension, and there was a basement room underneath that. It was a very nice house. And that's the doorway. And now, we get a doorway with side lights, a transom, and a fan line. And as you see, they could combine these details of square-headed and round-headed openings, because it's very Italian. -made. They didn't do that in the classic revival of men, at least not when they knew what they were doing. <laughs> but maybe it wasn't all the truth. This is one of my favorite houses. What a, it would be a house if I could choose in Jacksonville, the one I would prefer to live in. And I think it now belongs to the Oregon Historic, Southern Oregon Historical Society, or if it doesn't, it is going to belong to <laughs> two elder bashful liberals when I'd seen it. They didn't like to show it to ladies, I don't blame them. And we went through the house and saw it up, upstairs, and they got into the parlor after that. But you notice that it has a molded bricks around around the window. And uh, that's the uh, of the Italian. You could do that. Well, going on. Here is a building that was standing in Eugene. It was called Columbia College, an educational building. It didn't last very long, the building long since gone. And yet, there you see the Italian age man with the round large fan line over the main doorway. Uh, this was built about 18, 
Well, it was built by 1858 because this is in the Kukul and Dressel print of Eugene of 1858. And here is another collegiate building, which is in uh, is it Forest Grove, Pacific University. It was built about 1849, a building on the left, and it was the Hall Main Hall of uh, literally simple wooden group of structures, group of wooden structures. Uh, perhaps it originally wasn't Italianate, but uh, some detail was added. Now, more important perhaps for the Italianate style, all over the country was the fact that it was used for commercial buildings, shops, stores, and other such buildings. And now I take you back to the east to look at some buildings to show this development. First of all, commercial buildings grew to prominence in eastern cities about the 1820, groups of them, 1820 to 30. And here is a very pleasant stack building. It is classic revival, of course. And it is uh, the Tappan store, the A-T-T-A-N store in New York. And it was built by Town and Davis. <coughs> in 1829. There wasn't anything like that here in 1829. It is uh, stone-faced. At least the ground floor is stone-faced. And the upper floors, I'm not quite sure. They could have been brick and stucco. As you see, the houses on each side were brick. It is very rigorously simple. It has these anti-dot forms for the division into the three bay units, which had folding doors and windows inside. A bit, you know, made very handsome groups of buildings for cities along the whole of the eastern seaboard. And when we got some cities in the west, like San Francisco, we got it there as well. I've cut out some of the examples of this because I think I'm running too long on this whole part of course, and I will show you all that I've got. But this, oh, I beg your pardon, I want to go back to this. This shows you a block of buildings in New York, uh, which would be a similar to this. Uh, the Washington store, very simple, except almost certainly the division of the ground floor are cash time. And we'll see that coming into that. Very simple and restrained. Simple, simple and restrained interior. And then uh, the most remarkable example of this Italian style was uh, Mr. Stood's store on Lower Broadway, which you're seeing here in a print. It set the fashion for grandiose department stores right from the beginning. This was the good store by an architect named Snook and uh, Trench. And it was uh, built in 1846. Now that's, what, 16 years. That's 1845, 1846. And this one was all stone. Now let me give the leader. When Mr. Stewart built his store, he wanted to have it elegant, fashionable, and palace light, and it was, and it had a marble facing, and it has rich detail. And you notice that there is a different kind of detailing around each floor window, each, the windows in each floor. And that was, you know, the most fashionable store for many, many years. His store later became <coughs> one of them. Now. What happened was that <coughs> this would be expensive in any way you want to put it, because all the moldings were cut with hand. They had some machine tools in stone, in marble here, basically. And so there was a desire, of course, to have the elegance and richness of that without the cost. And the answer was in cast iron, which could be reduplicated from Cast iron is made with wooden forms, models, 
and they're pushed into sand, prepared sand, and the iron poured in, and you, get, you can get very elaborate designs. But you can also get something simple, and this is the classic revival sort of set here, with, rather than the um, uh, Renaissance, as you see in Stuart's story. And this is the building of the first considerable building of cast iron sort like this. It's the Bogardus building in New York, which was built in 1848, only two years after Stuart thought about it. And it has, the, it has a certain monotony. And it is repeated, but there it is in a drawing of the period. Bogardus was a very much American entrepreneur, businessman. And he had this said it was to be very influential throughout the country. And then because the cast iron the art itself was probably not so often shipped, but sometimes it was, but the model for it, the form of it, and it could be built almost anywhere. If you, and without the labor cost, of, that was the cost of labor of cutting all the detail in stone. And here it is, it is drawn. And it's, you know, it shows, 19th century prints are so wonderful, they're so happy compared to ours. And then it said that, all the chimneys are always smoking because business is good. <laughs> and even if disaster overtakes us, the chimneys are still smoking. <laughs> That's what an artist can do. Though so in reality, if it didn't have to have an accident, <laughs> it wouldn't be smoking. But they, it's often, they didn't seem to worry about it pollution of the atmosphere. And it was pretty polluted too at the time. But you know, it always because it showed that the whole thing wouldn't necessarily collapse because pieces could be blown out and it would still stick together. That was the, one of the great the great charms of the garden design where first of all it was economical. You could have quite elaborate detailing and secondly it was durable and it withstood a great many times. There's another design of Bogardus, and he did many designs, and this is a design for New York, of um, uh, another store, uh, the Singer Sewing Machine Company. And then you have, when you move into a little later period, I want to continue that just to show it. We get beyond our day. There is the later Stuart store in New York, because the first store store was too far downtown, and by the 70s, fashion had moved uptown, and he built this store uptown, and it is a store which was later turned into John Wanamaker's New York store. And that is cast iron, and that is a little bit more elaborate than the original iron building, but not more elaborate than the earlier Stuart store. And here is an example of a store with iron front in Baltimore. And this one has some special interest because it is a store building for the Robbins Paper Company in Baltimore, built in 1870. That's actually a little bit about the same time as this one. And it is interesting because Barter Robbins Company were manufacturers of iron front. And we had at least one example of that in Portland, which we'll see at some time in the near future. Now, looking at the buildings in Jacksonville, we'll come back to that because we have such a wonderful archive of material taken by Mr. Britt now in the Southern Oregon Historical Society, which I suppose I should say is possibly the most important of the regional historical societies in Oregon. And it's been very well supported by the Jackson County Commissioners. It, uh, it is housed in the one time courthouse in Jacksonville, not the one that we saw first, but the one that was built in the 80s. Here it is, looking out over the town of Jacksonville from Britt's front yard. Still a little messy. And there it is in a paint. He was a painter, I told you. And he could tidy things up somewhat. <laughs> you know, painter do. That is the Methodist church before it got switched around. This is the Cabot Courthouse, which I didn't show you. And this is one of the hotels 
uh, in on California Street in Jackson. No? And here we have some of the other buildings which you're going to see. This is the ILF building. And this is Oregon Street from this side. Yeah. Well, I've sort of given up on Jacksonville, but I used to know it pretty well. Uh, this is the building that is one of the first to be built. Uh, it is a building of the 50s, and it was in one of the prints of Jacksonville. I don't have all those little photographs. And it's now a library in Jacksonville. Uh, even it became a library after this photograph, which is taken over there, which you see on that, on that side. It was the Bruner Brothers thought of 1855. Kind of washed up a bit, but that still has Seems an odd place to put that kind of marker, but it might have been moved since not a lot of things were moved around in this area. Uh, 